The Dead Sea, which borders Jordan and Israel, gets its name because it's nearly 10 times as salty as the ocean, a harsh environment for either plants or animals. Despite this, thousands of years ago, the region surround, surrounding the lake was famous for succulent dates. The fruits were renowned not only for their sweetness, but for their use in treating respiratory problems and depression. Indeed, two millennia ago, Judean dates were Israel's biggest export. Between then and the time of the Crusades, wars and drought wrecked havoc on date cultivation, and the date forests disappeared. In the early 1960s, King Herod's fortress in Masada, near the Dead Sea, was being excavated and ancient date seeds were discovered beneath the rubble. To determine their age, the seeds were radiocarbon dated and one seed was determined to be a little over 2,100 years old, another slightly less than 2,000 years old. The seeds were carefully preserved and, decades later, some of the date seeds were planted as part of a project to regrow medicinal plants lost from the area. One seed that sprouted continued to grow and was nicknamed Methuselah after the oldest person in the Bible. <clears throat> On the first Sunday of this month, I introduced you to January's theme, sprouts. On this, the last Sunday of the month, I close out our reflections on the concept and metaphor of sprouting. Sprouts is a monthly theme included in the theme of our church year, Roots and Branches. Roots and Branches was chosen to resonate with our work on our church's vision, mission, and covenant, referring to the roots of our community that ground us, and the branches that extend out like our aspirations. Last week, Reverend Colin talked about our covenant, and next week, our guest minister, the Reverend Beth Dana, will talk about the intersection of tolerance and covenant. Now, when I think of Methuselah, the ancient date seed that sprouted centuries after its sibling seeds did, I think of a quote that at one time I had in a little frame in my condo. It is never too late to be what you might have been. This quote is attributed to one of the leading writers of the Victorian era, Marianne Evans, whose pen name was George Eliot. I once liked to think it is never too late to be what you might have been, but now I don't know that that's true. I might have been, and really would have loved to have been, a Tony Award-winning tap dancer on Broadway. But the fact that my knees have begun hurting as I climb the stairs to my office each morning, added to the fact that I've never actually had a tap dance lesson, <laughs> leads me to believe that that's never going to happen. I would instead amend this truism to say, it's not too late to be what you are now meant to be. Because you might have been something at one point in your life doesn't mean, that, doesn't mean that is what you are meant to be now. Because you're now meant to be something doesn't mean you were ready to be a couple of years ago. There are people who make a very convincing case that many of us are hindered by the concept that we have to be passionate about only one thing. Emily Wapnick begins her TED Talk by saying, raise your hand if you've ever been asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? She claims that while this question inspires kids to dream about what they could be, it does not inspire them to dream about all that they could be. She says it does the opposite because the assumption is you must choose one thing. She calls those people with many interests and creative pursuits multipotentialites. Other terms for this are polymath and renaissance person. During the renaissance period, it was considered the ideal to be well-versed in multiple disciplines. The great example is, of course, the painter, engineer, scientist, theorist, sculptor, and architect, Leonardo da Vinci. 
She goes on to describe some current people who have done similar things, using their passions for disparate things to their advantage. She claims that multipotentialites have what she calls superpowers, idea synthesis, rapid learning, and adaptability. These Renaissance people bring a wealth of skills to each new endeavor. Now, while no Leonardo, I began a new career when some of my friends were eyeing retirement. I typically tell the story of how I came to be a UU minister at Membership 101, but I realized many of you probably hadn't heard it. I was very involved in my Methodist church growing up. I was president of the youth group and sang in the choir. Becoming a minister flickered across my mind, but I dismissed it. Although I could not have articulated it, down deep I knew a gay kid in Kentucky in the early 80s wasn't going to be a happy or successful Methodist minister. I followed my other interests. Years later, I was drawn to Unitarian Universalism because of UU's ability to find wisdom in multiple faith traditions. It never made sense to me that in all the world throughout thousands of years, due to being born in the exact right place at the right time, I was privy to the sole religion that could provide salvation. Now, I know I'm special, but come on. I became more and more involved in my UU church and after I met my husband, Conrad, I introduced him to the church. Score, Methodist minus two, you use plus two. <laughs> he remembers better than I the conversation when we talked about using our gifts in the world. It suddenly occurred to me that maybe all those experiences and skills I had been acquiring through my other interests might have led me to that point to be able to seriously consider the call to ministry. With his huge support, I left the corporate world and entered seminary. Maybe it is never too late to be what you might have been. Although in second grade, I, have, I had a different career in mind. Like Emily Wapnick asked in her TED Talk, I was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? In one of the very few specific experiences that I remember from elementary school, the teacher was working with one of the reading groups at the front of the classroom. In our class, and I imagine many others, the class had been divided into three groups, the red birds, yellow birds, and blue birds. These avian titles did very little to obscure the fact that we had been divided according to reading ability. She was working with the yellow birds one day and it occurred to her because of something that they were reading to ask the entire class what they wanted to be when we grew up. When she called on me, I announced that I intended to be a garbage man. Now, with all due humility, I was the best reader in Mrs. Bullock's red bird reading group. So she was taken aback that I wanted to be a garbage man. She actually called me to the front of the room, put her arm around me, and asked how I had come to make that decision. Well, I replied that garbage men get to wear really cool yellow slickers and get to ride on the back of big trucks. Even then, I knew it was all about wardrobe and making an entrance. <laughs> To this day, I don't think garbage man, or I guess it, today it would be called refuse removal person, is a poor career option. Heaven knows they're needed, and they probably sometimes make more than Mrs. Bullock did as a teacher. I tell this story to relate that what we imagine we will do at one point in our life isn't necessarily what we'll be doing forever, if at all. What others want or expect us to do plays a big part in what we decide to do, of course. Siddharth Gautama was born around 567 BCE, just below the Himalayan foothills. When he was a few days old, a holy man prophesied that he would become either a great military conqueror or a great spiritual teacher. His father, the king, preferred that the prince become a military conqueror. 
The king kept his son within the confines of the palace, training him accordingly in archery, swordsmanship, and various sports. He was carefully shielded from knowledge of religion and human suffering. He married, had a son, and seemed to have everything. He had virtually no experience of the world outside the opulent palace, but something drew him to explore that outside world. Overcome with curiosity, he asked a charioteer to take him throughout the country. In the streets of the capital, he encountered three seemingly everyday sights. He encountered a sick man, an old man, and a corpse being carried to the burial grounds. His sheltered life had not prepared him for this. He was shocked. He became further upset when the charioteer told him that everyone is subject to sickness, old age, and death. Returning to the palace, they passed a monk, and the charioteer explained that the ascetic had renounced the world and sought release from the fear of death and suffering. Well, Prince Siddhartha resolved to leave his former life behind and search for an answer to the problem of suffering. He left the palace, shaved his head, and donned a beggar's robe. He rode to the forest to begin his quest for enlightenment. Now, as many of you already know, Prince Siddhartha did become enlightened and become, became the Buddha. He taught and shared his insights all over eastern India and became the primary figure of Buddhism. Now, despite the outcomes of these two stories, separated by 2,500 years, I am not advocating quitting whatever you're now doing to become a Buddhist priest or a UU minister. However, our fourth UU principle affirms a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And a search is an ongoing process, not a destination. I'm asking that you intentionally and continuously seek out deeper meaning in your spiritual life and in your efforts to change the world for the better. At the risk of torturing today's metaphor, stay ready to sprout. You may think, well, of course, I continue to learn and reconsider ideas to refine what I believe and consider true. But I don't think that's a given with everyone. Some people don't change their opinions because they've been in their families for so long. I've talked to people who have the same views and give virtually the same opinions about things after decades, regardless of changes in the world, circumstances, or events. But in the words of Muhammad Ali, the man who views the world at 50, the same as he did at 20, has wasted 30 years of his life. I mentioned earlier our working on our covenant, which we recited earlier. We are a covenantal church, united by our promises of how we will treat one another and the world. And it's a place where we join together to seek deeper meaning and reflect on our spiritual lives. Members of a creedal church, on the other hand, unite around accepting the same set of beliefs, a creed. One of the unintended consequences of creeds in a church, in my humble opinion, is that once that belief is found and agreed upon, those questions have an answer. Ongoing spiritual work can get stymied. I was looking at excerpts from Elaine Pagel's book, The Gnostic Gospels, in order to share one of them at George Cawthon's memorial service yesterday. She writes about the Gnostics and their alternative take on the message of Jesus. The Gnostic understands Christ's message not as offering a set of answers, but as an encouragement to engage in a process of searching, she explains. Then she quotes the gospel. Seek and inquire about the ways you should go, since there is nothing else as good as this. In another passage, she writes, the living Jesus of these texts speaks of illusion and enlightenment, not of sin and repentance, like the Jesus of the New Testament. 
Instead of coming to save us from sin, he comes as a guide who opens access to spiritual understanding. We can take these things we've learned up to this point in our lives to continue to better seek truth and meaning. We can synthesize our skills and talents to help better our community and the world in new and unexpected ways. In the words of Mary Oliver, a bow that still, after all these years, could take root, sprout, branch out, bud, make of its life a breathing palace of leaves. Our lives may prove to be more fruitful than we could ever have imagined. <laughs> Which reminds me, three years ago, staff of the Arava Institute were able to begin harvesting dates from the ancient date palm, Hannah. She produced almost 700 dates after being pollinated by Methuselah and two other ancient date palms named Adam and Jonah. The date's flavor is reported to be semi-dry with honey tones. Amen.